Okay, let's get started. My name is Nathaniel McCollum and I'm a principal engineer at Red Hat. Uh, this class is cryptography for beginners. So we need to start out by a disclaimer. I am not going to teach you thorough cryptography in the next half an hour. Okay, there are long courses on this. People spend decades of their lives studying it. So we're not going to attempt to cram all of that in one hour. Uh, the goal of this uh, talk is just going to be give, to give you a simple introduction to some of the concepts and then uh, there'll be links at the end if you want to dive into more detail uh, that you can go do that on your own. Uh, so let's get, let's get started. Uh, <coughs> the, the first uh, encryption we're going to talk about is actually the uh, Caesar cipher, which is probably the one that you are all familiar with. It's the one that you used to pass notes to each other, you know, in fifth grade when you didn't want people to see what you were saying. Uh, and it basically works with a simple shift pattern. Uh, so you shift by two, all the A's become C's, all the B's become D's. Does this sound familiar to you guys on this? Okay, so you take this, this little statement over here, welcome to flock, and if you shift it two, that's what it looks like. So it's hard to read for, uh, for the average English speaker. A, uh, a Dane might be able to speak that pretty well. But, uh, <laughs> but no, for the average English speaker, we have no idea uh, what that says. And uh, so this was, a, this was a very convenient way to do it. And if you don't kind of know the little trick, right, then you don't know how to decode it. Well, the problem, of course, is that this really isn't secure. Uh, with any significant amount of analysis, you can actually reverse engineer what this says, uh, which is the reverse process, right? So we shift it back. Uh, two spaces, all the C's become A's, all the B's become D's, and so on. And uh, our nice Danish phrase uh, simply becomes welcome to the flock again. Now, lots of information is being leaked in this cipher, so it's certainly not secure. Uh, you can, by statistical analysis, you know the contents are English, uh, so you can sort of figure out what some of the letters are, what they might map to, to go backwards. Uh, so this is not uh, something you would use in, uh, for anything more than a, a great uh, lesson with your kids. It's really fun, by the way, to teach your kids this kind of stuff, because when you get all the little notes passed around the house, because uh, <coughs> they think they're keeping it secret from you, but you can read. So we're going to have a pop quiz here. Cool. Using this basic technique that I've taught you in the last 30 seconds, what does this say? Write it down. If you have a piece of paper or a computer in front of you, write it down. Think about it. You know the answer? OK, go. Genius. Now, how did, tell me how you figured that out. So you, you did a very basic statistical analysis by noticing some of the commonalities to I hear and correspondence to English phrases. And by that, you were able to deduce, without knowing the actual answer uh, or the shift code that was used for this, you were able to determine uh, the, the primary, the plain text, as we call it in cryptography. So uh, a step up from that, uh, probably the most famous of all early cryptography was the Enigma machine. Uh, <coughs> You can see that it, it was uh, actually invented by a German guy named Arthur, and uh, he filed for the patent in 1918, and it was in commercial use in the 1920s. Now, this was done uh, right at the end of World War I, and uh, was used very heavily by the Nazis in World War II. So one of the, for the Allied powers, one of the very important things for us was to crack the cryptography. Uh, so this was actually cracked by uh, the the Polish Secret Service, uh, three guys there uh, were able to figure it out. And there's a really fascinating history here that sort of illustrates a lot of what happens in actual cryptography, uh, which is that uh, they did not actually crack the machine, which is a fascinating phenomenon. Uh, although there are weaknesses in the Enigma machine that we n now know of today that we could crack it, uh, they did not actually crack it uh, because there was a defect in the machine at the time. They cracked it because people were using the machine wrong, right? And so this is, this is the way it is in a lot of cryptography. We can give you cryptographic principles, but the vast majority of the problems in cryptography come from procedure, procedural error. You're simply using the cryptography incorrectly. <coughs> Moving on, we'll talk next about the one-time pad. The one-time pad is the most basic form of encryption. 
Uh, you, this is actually in binary. If you haven't noticed, there's no numbers here for both zero and one. Uh, so we have this plain text. This is the, this is the uh, thing that we want to keep secret. We want to pass it to someone else, and we want nobody in between to know what's going on. That's the top line. Okay? And then we have a key that we use, and this is what we're gonna, how we're going to hide uh, this plain text. And we do it with a very simple mathematical operation called XOR. That's the symbol over here. Okay? And XOR just simply means uh, only one of the two can be true. So if this is one and this is one, then if you XOR them together, you get zero. If only one of them is one, then you get one, and so on. So if they're both zero, then you get zero. If they're both one, you get zero. Otherwise, if they're different, you get one. Very simple mathematical operation, and the XOR operation is the, the, the bedrock of all of cryptography. So very, very simple. Um, in fact, a lot of people joke that uh, cryptographers really only know how to XOR. That's the only thing that they know how to do, <coughs> which is very true. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes, goes into it as well. So, uh, so you can also kind of see here that there's a decryption operation implicit as well. If you XOR in the opposite direction, you get the plain text back, right? Which is, these are the two bedrock uh, operations of cryptography, encrypt and decrypt. And they are in group. Yes? Why XOR? Uh, uh, the only one that is Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so we can go in both directions, right? Uh, can somebody tell me a downside to this encryption? What's that? It's, uh, it's binary. So we can convert pretty much anything to binary if we want. Uh, that's really not a problem. You know too much already. No more. This is for beginners. <laughs> well, you, you can easily decrypt it, which is great, right? Because we want the decryption operation to be very efficient. Uh, so we want you to go backwards. You can't decrypt it if you don't know the key, right? So that's, that's the point. You want to keep it secret. Okay, so that's definitely a problem. That's not the specific problem I'm looking for, but it's, the, but it's related to that problem. You, you have to give this ciphertext to your party, and you have to give them the key. So what's the problem that arises out of that? I think you had a hand up. No, no, because you can always reduce your message to binary. So just assume that for the rest of the class. You can always reduce your message. Thank you. The message must be the same length as the key in a one-time pad. Okay? So if you want to send a short message like this, sending a short key is, is fine, but you have essentially doubled the amount of data that you need to send uh, to the remote party. What happens if you want to transfer 10 terabytes worth of data using one-time pads? How much, how large does your key need to be? I mean, well, your key needs to be 10 terabytes, your message is 10 terabytes, so you have 20 terabytes total, right? So this is very inefficient. We don't want to double all of the traffic on the internet. Uh, so, so this is one of the reasons why one-time pad is not used, uh, or rather it is used as a building block to build other kinds of encryption. Uh, the, I want to ask the question about one-time pad, is it secure? Does it have perfect security? Thank you, Simo's got it right. There's, two, there's actually two principles. It has perfect security so long as the key is random and the key is never reused. As soon as you start reusing the key for other operations, then people can begin to determine by the messages that you send, uh, send they can start to do the, the statistical analysis against the message and they can reverse engineer the key and then you're completely uh, hosed. So uh, one time pad is secure, but it has some very stringent criteria, right? And so we're gonna see these criteria play out in uh, some, some other ways. So, so the first way we can get past the problem, right? The major problem here is the one time pad is that the key has to be as long as the message. So one of the ways that we get around this, the basic way we get around it is by using a pseudo random function. This is often times called a PRF. A PRF takes m bits of input 
and produces n bits of output. So one of the things that a PRF can be used to do is to expand essentially the size of the key because our third principle will hold that the output is indistinguishable from random. Okay, so uh, if you've ever used a hash function, a hash function like SHA-1, for instance, uh, is a PRF. You provide it some input, it provides some output, the output is indistinguishable from random. So building on this, we have the concept of a stream cipher. And a stream cipher is essentially where we take a seed, uh, which is our key. Uh, this is the basic building block. Uh, this a stream cipher is not actually this simple, but this is what it's built on top of. So you take your key as your input to your PRF, and you XOR that against the plain text, which is what we saw on the previous slide. So that allows you to expand the key. So I can pass you perhaps a key that's maybe 16 bytes, and then I can send you the 10 terabyte message, and you can use the PRF to expand that key into 10 terabytes to do, to do the uh, XOR operation. Okay. Now, again, no stream cipher is actually this simple. Uh, because there are there are definitely problems with this approach, uh, but it's the basic the basic idea behind stream ciphers. And we want to ask the question again: Is it secure? What's that? I'm oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have actually three principles now. Uh, the basic principle is that it is secure if the seed is random, if the seed is never reused and if the PRF is a true PRF. In other words, the output of that function is truly indistinguishable from random. So there's, here's some examples of some, some, some stream ciphers. Uh, the, uh, first, the first one we have is ARC4. It's spelled this way, which is actually a trademark issue. They've trademarked it and you can't use that term, so you can call it ARC4. Uh, Salsa20 is another one. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't use stream ciphers that heavily today. There are some that are secure, um, but most of the stream ciphers do have known attacks. So the very simple principles we've started, we have to start building more complex layers on top of them. So let's talk about key reuse. So one of our principles is that we definitely can't reuse the key. If we reuse the key, we can begin to do statistical analysis and we can reverse engineer uh, the, the message that's being sent. Okay, so one of the things we need to talk about is the birthday paradox, which is just a very simple question. If you know the answer to this question, don't answer. Okay, uh, what are the odds that two people in this room have the same birthday? Anybody know? He says we know we can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think you know, you can answer. If you're not, if you're not sure. More than 50%, who said that? Great, it is more than 50%, well it's, yeah, we're probably more than 50% now, or we're very close to it, okay? Let's go around the room, let's try this as an exercise, because it's kind of fun. December 31st. Yeah, talk louder, and if you hear your birthday, yell out. What? 9th of April? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? <laughs> Happy birthday. September 25th. April 29th. What? April 29th. May 24th. November 2nd. That's yours. We got it. We got it. Okay. So yes, we, we did actually achieve it. Uh, the birthday paradox uh, is that what you would think is you would kind of like divide up the people in the room, figure out how many people there were against the number of days in the year, and that's actually incorrect. Your intuition is incorrect. Uh, the birthday paradox is that uh, the, you have an exponential increase actually in the, uh, based upon the number of people that are in the room, how likely it is for you to get someone else with the same exact birthday. So we don't even have to get close to say 180 days in order to get 50% certainty, we get 50% certainty uh, with, with just 23 people in the room, which is about what we have here. So, and you saw that played out, that there was in fact 
someone you knew with the same birthday. Uh, so this is a real problem in cryptography because if your principle is that you can't reuse the key, and very, very quickly, the more times that you use a random key, how likely are you to hit the, hit the same key again? Okay, and the answer is very likely. Uh, so there's a lot of techniques that go into making sure that that is not the case, and a lot of care is given around making sure uh, key reuse is one of the most fundamental errors in cryptography. It's the reason, for instance, why um, WEP on Wi-Fi is completely insecure, uh, because they reuse the keys. And so all you have to do is observe a certain number of packets flowing over the wireless network. You can just observe it by sniffing them. Uh, once you have a certain number, you can use the birthday paradox to be able to reduce uh, your odds, and you can guess the, the WEP key very, very quickly. <clears throat> Next, let's talk about block ciphers. Block ciphers are a lot about stream ciphers, except that instead of operating on a continual stream of data, they operate in blocks. Uh, they have a fixed size, uh, and this is a fixed size for both the keys and the blocks. I'll give you two examples here because it's, it's often misunderstood that AES-256 has a 256-bit block size, which it does not. Uh, actually, they have the same block size uh, what changes is the size of the key that you use in order to protect the data. Okay. <clears throat> now, block ciphers can be used on their own, but one of the problems that we will run into is the question of key reuse. So if you have a bunch of blocks of data and you're using the same key over all of those blocks of data, how quickly are we going to find another key? Well, the birthday paradox tells us that we're going to find another key pretty quickly. So uh, what we actually need to do is we have, need to have modes that prevent this. Uh, modes also prevent the leakage of data based upon the broad structure of the blocks. And I'm going to use an image to illustrate that in just a second. Uh, the, I've given two modes here. Uh, the common mode you might immediately think of is this one, the ECB, where you have some plain text and you have a key and you give it to whatever your cipher is, like AES, for instance and out comes your ciphertext, and then you move on to the next block. And you do the same thing, the plain text goes into the cipher operation along with the key, and you get another block out, and then you just kind of append them all together, right? Seems sensible. Well, the problem is, this is what ECB mode encryption looks like. So if you were to do that technique, uh, you can see that all we've really done is kind of obscure the data, we haven't hidden it. So is it, is it obvious to everyone in the room what this is? Right? So uh, is, this, is this what you want your banking stuff secured with? The answer is no, <laughs> you don't. Uh, so, uh, so instead we use other modes uh, that hopefully produce something that looks like that on the other side. Uh, one of those modes is called CBC, and there's uh, many of these. <coughs> so, and the way that this works is it adds an initial initialization vector, and then each block uses the previous block in its output, so that there's a trailing effect which obscures the data all throughout the encryption. Okay? Uh, this often requires an initialization vector, which is usually random, and as, uh, as it's done in cryptography, you usually just append the, uh, the IV to the beginning of, the, of what the message you're sending, and then you uh, have the encrypted blocks afterwards. So again, here, the, what we're trying to get to is this, not this. Now, is ECB mode insecure? It's a good guess, but, can't, but that's incorrect. Uh, there's, n there's no IV in, in ECB mode because you're just doing in each block independently. Yep. The answer is yes, ECB is mode is secure when you're doing what? One block, right? Because if you're using only one block, then you can't see these relationships between the blocks. So if, you have, if you're wanting to do some very simple encryption of some very small data, then ECB mode is fine. Use it uh, for, for just that limited case, just make sure you don't need another key. Does that need to be the one-time password? What's that? Isn't that the one-time password? Um, it is. Yes, it is essentially a one-time pass. So
So now we have the problem of, uh, we have, we've talked about stream ciphers, we've talked about block ciphers, and one of the problems that then arises is how do we send the key, uh, or how do we communicate a key for encryption with, without uh, sending it over the wire, right? Because if I just send you the key and the ciphertext, well, then anybody can decrypt it because they just take the key and they decrypt the ciphertext, right? So we have to have some other way of transmitting a key or at least agreeing upon a key. Uh, one way we might do this uh, is the classic espionage me method. I take a, uh, take a big USB key, I put a bunch of keys on it, and I tape it under a park bench, and I walk away, and you come up in your, uh, in your, in your fedora and your, uh, your jacket, <coughs> and your glasses on, and you look like a spy, and you grab it, only you're actually an attacker. You're not the person who was intended to receive the key. So now, uh, any message that I send is completely insecure, right? So uh, if you can do a personal transfer of key, it, it, it works, but it's very, very high latency. We want something that's much more efficient. And so uh, we actually have uh, two brilliant guys, Diffie and Hellman, uh, great cryptographers. They came up with this idea of key exchange or key agreement. And basically the way that this works is it allows two parties to use a mathematical operation to agree upon a key. And the key is random. And nobody who's listening to it can figure out what the key is. So th this is a, one of the other bedrocks of cryptography. So let's start by looking over on the left, or I guess your right, my left. Uh, we'll look at the paint colors. So Alice and Bob both start with some yellow paint. And they know that that yellow paint is the same. And that yellow paint doesn't have to be a secret. Okay, so that's the huge advantage here. They don't have to meet in secret somewhere to say, we're gonna use this color for the yellow paint, right? They can, they can announce it to the world. We're using yellow paint. Now, they generate a random number, and in this case, the random number is going to be their secret color, and they're not gonna tell anybody what their secret color is. They're not even gonna tell each other what their secret color is, okay? So Alice is gonna mix red in with yellow, and she's gonna get orange. Bob is going to mix uh, cyan, or whatever that is, and, uh, and, and come up with blue. Okay. Now these, these two uh, colors as the result of the operation are public. They can share them. So they send them out over the wire in plain text. Alice says, Bob, I'm using orange. And Bob says to Alice, I'm using blue. And so now they both have those colors. Now the assumption here is that it's very cheap and easy to mix the colors, but it's very difficult and expensive to unmix the colors. Okay? So because uh, if Alice now mixes her red in with Bob's blue, she will get brown. And if uh, Bob mixes Alice's orange with his cyan, he will also get brown. So notice that they have the same common secret when it's done. But nobody who's listening into this exchange, so if somebody were listening in to what colors they were sharing here, no one would be able to calculate brown because they don't know the private colors. The point is, is that on both sides, Alice, Alice has added both, uh, so Bob added blue in here, or cyan in here to create blue, and then Alice added red in, so it's yellow, cyan, and red. And then the same exact operation happened just in a different order on the other side. So the resulting Brown, nobody else knows except for Alice and Bob, even though Alice and Bob announced in public, uh, I'm using orange and I'm using blue. And so the resulting key now, the brown, can be used for encryption, and nobody who was listening into the conversation uh, can, can uh, use the key and, and decrypt the data. So this is the actual mathemat mathematical operation. That's actually very simple. Uh, it uses the concept of finite cyclic groups. I'm not going to explain that here. Uh, if you want to know more about this, um, you can see the material at the end, though. Uh, so basically, we create the random number, which is a private. That's the private color that they're keeping secret. Then you have the generator, which is the yellow color. And you raise the generator to the power of the private number. That creates the public number. You share the public number over the network. Both sides do this, and once each side has the public number, uh, you simply raise the public number to the private number. 
And because uh, the order of operations doesn't matter, in, in the case uh, we have the commutative, <coughs> excuse me, the commutative property here, uh, the end result is that they both decay no matter which way they've done the operation. So the commutative property is the same on the same way? No. 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 They do not. They only need to start with the same G. That's the yellow. Okay. And G can be public. Because effectively they both have G to the G raised to the crib one times crib two. Yes. Because when you raise something with a power to another power, it's just multiplying the powers. That's correct. So they basically are known as yellow and agreed upon. Yeah, so yellow is agreed upon beforehand. Everyone in the world knows about yellow. Uh, when you when you're doing when you're doing this, a, a, a particular cyclic group will typically have a defined generator. So it's just literally listed in a document somewhere saying the generator is one, two, three, four. Uh, and that generator is then used for all cryptographic operations. So the G does not need to be public, uh, in fact, or it does not need to be private, it's completely public. The uh, private number that you generate from random is, is the one you have to keep secret. Yes? It allows us to like do math isn't this uh, Yes, yes it is. Uh, <coughs> you are, you're exactly correct. Uh, all of this uh, cryptography, both here and the next thing we're gonna talk about, which is asymmetric cryptography, uh, is based on Fermat's theorem and Euler's theorem. Oh, we have a problem with Diffie Hellman key exchange. So it's a really, really great little trick. Uh, it's completely secure from anyone who's listening in, but it's not secure from active attacks. Uh, this means that someone that can actually intercept the message and then send their own message. Okay? And the reason for this is that they'll just pretend to be Bob on the other side and they'll complete the exchange and then to, uh, uh, they'll pretend to be Bob to Alice and then they'll pretend to be Alice to Bob. And the end result is you have someone in the middle. Now the communications would be encrypted from Alice to the attacker and then from the attacker to Bob, but now you have a party in the middle that's listening in. Right? So uh, the Diffie-Hellman is, uh, is a great technique, but it's a building block to other things that are going to happen. One of those other things that are gonna happen is authenticated key exchange. And authenticated is a key, a key exchange is a variant of the Diffie-Hellman. And there's a lot of these here. I've listed, uh, what, five of them here. Uh, <coughs> some of these are patented, by the way. Um, so the, uh, it's a variant of the Diffie-Hellman exchange. And the basic idea behind an authenticated key exchange is that it uses some other secret in order to prove that each side knows each other and it gets mixed into the operation. And there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, generally speaking, these are all called PAKES, password authenticated key exchanges, because you can use a password uh, on either side, you mix it into the algorithm, and then at the end of the operation, down here where we get brown, if you're doing authenticated key exchange, uh, you'll only, both sides will get brown only if they both had know the same password. Okay, so in that case, you actually protect against uh, a man in the middle attack. Uh, like I said, some of these are patented, uh, <coughs> which is why they have brought this and not been used. Uh, these three on the bottom, uh, the, I am not aware of any patents on these. Uh, and both of these are standardized in various different ways. Uh, including SRPV6 is, is standardized in some RFCs. Uh, so, <coughs> and we're gonna be using Spake uh, in Kerberos, it came to my Kerberos talk yesterday. Uh, that's the algorithm we're gonna be using in Kerberos to uh, strengthen up some things. So the nice thing about the authenticated key exchange is that it protects against the active attacks. And uh, another method, for instance, of doing this, which is the way TLS works, uh, is that you can sign one of the public keys and then by verifying the signature, you can actually prove that the other party is who they say they are and you can trust their public key. Uh, one last thing to note about authenticated key exchanges is that it's actually really useful for another technique, which is to increase password strength. So if you want to encrypt something <coughs> using a password, a password is very low entropy, right? Because there's only 26 letters in the English alphabet and there's only so many combinations of those letters that you can have, you know, that form words, for instance, which is what everybody does with a password because everyone's insecure. Uh, so, and how many times has password been used as a password? Uh, if you try to encrypt something using a low entropy, low entropy password like that, it will be fairly easy to, uh, to do a brute force attack, uh, offline dictionary attack against the packets that are sent 
and recover the data. Uh, but using authenticated key exchange, you can actually use the passwords only to prove public keys, and then the public keys generate a very, very strong key, session key that's used for the encryption. So it's helpful to actually increase password strength. The last topic we're gonna talk about today is asymmetric encryption, because I, I told you we're not gonna dive too deep in any of these topics, there's, there's more resources at the end. Uh, asymmetric encryption is, uh, which you're actually using both symmetric and asymmetric. Everything we've talked about up to this point has been symmetric. Um, that the encryption was done based upon a key that both sides know. Uh, in this case, we're gonna break that assumption. This was uh, discovered by a uh, Brit, Clifford Cox, uh, who was working for the uh, British Secret Service or whatever it's called. I don't know. MI5 or MI6. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he actually discovered it, but his, his discovery was classified. They did not publish it. And uh, simultaneously in the United States, it was uh, discovered by these three guys, uh, which is where we get RSA. Uh, so RSA the company and RSA the, uh, the encryption, uh, the asymmetric uh, algorithm are come from these guys, from Rivas, Shamir, and Adam. Uh, this is built on principles from the Diffie-Hellman. So the idea, the basic idea with Diffie-Hellman, of course, is that we have a one-way function it's very easy to mix the colors together, but it's very <coughs> hard to unmix them. And what these guys came up with was that if there was a way to have some secret knowledge so that it would be easy to mix them and hard to unmix them, but easy to unmix them if you knew something secret, okay? That's called the trapdoor function. And so asymmetric encryption is built on this principle of the trapdoor function. And now you actually have two keys, like in the Diffie-Hellman. Uh, if we go back to the Diffie Hellman, you remember we have a public and a private, two separate keys, right? There's the private, there's the public. We have the same exact thing in asymmetric keys. So the public key can be used for encryption, and the private key can be used for decryption. Here's a nice little chart from Wikipedia. So if we look on the left-hand side, this is all the encryption we've been talking about up until this point. And what RSA does uh, is it actually splits this one key into two keys so that you can use the public key for doing encryption and the private key for doing decryption. Now, this has a, a very marked advantage. Uh, if we were just doing symmetric encryption and I wanted you all to send me an encrypted message, okay? All of you are gonna send a message to one person, so many to one. Now, I would have to go to each of you and I'd have to exchange a unique key because out between you and between you and between you, I would need separate communication keys in order, to, in order to keep the data private. With asymmetric encryption, however, I can split that key into two. And I can say, uh, everyone in the room, this is my public key. And then you can all encrypt to me using that one public key. And in response, I can decrypt all of your messages uh, using my private key. But I've never told you my private key, so only I can decrypt. And this is the bedrock foundation of TLS or SSL, right? So when you go to a website and you see, is the website trusted? That's asymmetric cryptography. What you're doing is you're actually validating the public key of that website. So we're actually doing well on time here. We're almost done. And I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, there's a lot of topics I have not covered. I've not covered things like message integrity. Uh, so in other words, proving that the message did not change in transport. Uh, I've not covered uh, things like signing or verification or lots of other topics. So there's, there's a lot more to learn. Cryptography is a very, very big topic. There are two courses which I can recommend. Both of these are online and free and have a substantial amount of data. Uh, and I can share these slides out with people. Or you can just Google Learn Cryptography and I'm sure that these will be in the top list. So there's one from Khan Academy and there's one from Stanford. <coughs> Uh, the Stanford one will, does, assumes that you have a lot of the math, so if all of the stuff that I've talked about was fairly mathematically easy for you, and if you know what I mean when I'm talking about when I say finite cyclic groups, uh, then go take the, the Stanford cryptography course, it's, it's a great place to start. If you don't know what that stuff is, don't feel bad, uh, start at the Khan Academy course because they can actually give you the math as well uh, along with the cryptography. So, that's all I have for today. Are there any questions? Oh, actually, I was, we were going to come back to this to see if anybody solved it, but we, we had a smart aleck in the room. 
So the, and the answer was, the answer was, hello world, and the shift was seven. So that's all. Questions? Yes? Which is the private key. <coughs> the difference is that in the Diffie Hellman, you both are agreeing on the same, it's an exchange, and you're both agreeing on the same key at the bottom. And you're using that key to do symmetric encryption. I think what you're saying was simply that you cannot deserve the Hellman. That's correct. In, in technical speak, a Diffie-Hellman is a one-way function, and a, um, the asymmetric encryption is a trapdoor function, because it's one way unless you know the secret information that you can open the trapdoor and reverse it. Uh, there is actually a way to do that. It's called hughes -Spick, or uh, excuse me, Hughes-Diffie-Hellman. Uh, hughes there is a there is a variant of the Diffie Hellman algorithm that can be used to transfer a key from one party to another. Uh, it's generally not used because it's not applicable in a lot of situations. Um, but uh, Diffie Hellman has the advantage that both sides contribute entropy, uh, which means that I contribute randomness and you contribute randomness. So if an attacker were saying we're trying to do part of that exchange and and we're not going to use a random number. It wouldn't matter because I'm still mixing in my random number with theirs. So both sides get to contribute entropy, and the resulting key we know then uh, has the entropy that both sides contributed. So you're not sending a key from A to B. You're actually mutually agreeing upon a key. Yes? Any other questions? I know I didn't explain it that well. There's some questions we need to talk about. What's that? Some questions you didn't talk oh. about in your summary. What do you mean? You didn't answer what's the big deal about what's the curve and are you a secret agent? Oh, okay. I can answer those two questions. <laughs> okay, so elliptic curves. Uh, I did not put them in this talk. You're right. Um, so let's go, actually, we're on the right talk. Uh, so most of this math you can see is just done, can be done with integers, right? Well, the problem is that our computers are getting really fast and the, <coughs> the size of these keys are getting longer, larger and larger so that computers can't crack them. And uh, this only has, or this has a negative benefit or a negative result because uh, now we have to send all these larger keys over the wire. Uh, and they are growing exponentially larger as computers get faster and faster. So elliptic curves is another finite cyclic group. One finite cyclic group uh, is just uh, a, the set of, uh, of numbers underneath the prime number, which is what we're using in this case. But in the case of a, an elliptic curve, you can actually use a, an elliptic curve on a graph uh, and do mathematical operations on that curve. It allows you to keep your key sizes very small, but it's very expensive for computers to calculate. So you can send much smaller key sizes, uh, and this has, this has the benefit of protecting your security. Uh, the answer to the other one, which was, am I a secret agent? Uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to tell you. Yes, if you don't want to keep anything that you have secret. <laughs> yeah, no, you should definitely not do your own cryptography. Uh, you should always rely on what uh, has, number one, been proven uh, in an academic paper, uh, which is undisputed, uh, that it's, that's provably secure. Uh, and second of all, don't use your own implementation of those algorithms, because your own implementation will almost always contain a flaw so use, this, use the standard libraries that you're given, and even then, make sure you research a lot, and uh, if you're designing anything, just don't design it. You're saying that's part of the design of the device, correct? Correct. That's correct. In fact, you're probably designing a system that won't work, but if you can get it to work, it's probably incredibly insecure.
So the way you design good systems is by open peer review. Uh, this is this is the bedrock of, of cryptography. It's the bedrock of all scholarship in general, right? So uh, you want to obviously have a much broader introduction to cryptography than the half an hour I've given you. Uh, you probably want to have a degree in it as well as a degree in mathematics. Uh, you will then uh, publish uh, what you propose as a design. Uh, you will publish it openly and you will accept critique from anywhere. Uh, and so you allow it to, to be to sit out in public, you'll get critiques. You may have to mitigate some of those critiques. You may tweak the algorithm a little bit here or there. Uh, but after substantial uh, peer review, usually multiple years of uh, peer review, if there's no attacks found, uh, then at that point it's considered uh, secure. And at that point, people start implementing it in, in insecure ways. Uh, so then you have to deal with the fact that most of the implementations of these algorithms are also insecure. Uh, that has to mature over time as well, hopefully with public peer review. Never use closed source cryptography, just don't do it, ever, uh, because it means it hasn't had the open peer review that you need to make sure that it's secure. So rely on open source code for all cryptography. So, thank you very much.